Our speaker today is Professor Adelson Lotta, the Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University. Um, professor Motta was born in Curitiba in Brazil and received his PhD in 2002 from the University of Campinas near Sao Paulo in Brazil in theoretical physics and applied mathematics. After brief uh, postdoctoral work at um, Arizona State, at the Max Planck Institute for Complex Systems in Dresden, and then as a um, um, director's fellow at Los Alamos, he became an assistant professor in 2006 at Northwestern University. In 2011, he was promoted to the rank of full professor, and he is now um, the Charles E. and Emma H. Morrison Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University. Uh, Professor Motto is very well known uh, for his work in, um, in network theory um, and related fields. And his work has been recognized by a number of honors over the years. He was um, the Alfred P. Sloan uh, Foundation Fellow early on in his career. Then he had the Career Award from the National Science Foundation. In 2013, he received the Erdős Rainey Prize uh, for Network Science from the Network Science Society. Uh, he was elected fellow of the APS, the American Physical Society, in and in 2015, he was elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancements of Science. Uh, he was also a Simons Fellow in Theoretical Physics in 2015. And in 2015 to 2016, he chaired the topical group on statistical and nonlinear physics of the APS. Um, so it gives me great pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Adelson Motta, and he will talk about new states in uh, complex systems. Let's welcome Professor Motta. Thank you very much for having me here today. I had uh, an enjoyable day interacting with many people across the department. And thank you, Edgar, for the nice introduction. Uh, at least part of the presentation was guaranteed to be good, <laughs> independent of my talk. Uh, so today I will present on recent research that I've, um, I've completed with a number of um, talented students, postdocs, and uh, senior colleagues whose names will appear throughout my talk, while funded by these organizations. And um, it is on Is this better? Is there a volume control? Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Since I was told that there are students in the room and to make sure that we are all on the same page, I will start from the very beginning, um, the motivation of my talk. Uh, as many of you know, there was a time when leading scientists thought that uh, most things were already sorted out. And this translation from Laplace really conveys it, where he says that an intellect which at a certain moment would know all forces that set nature in motion and all positions of all items of which nature is composed, if this intellect were also uh, vast enough to submit this data to analysis for such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain in the past, just like the future would be presented to the right. So now, 200 years later, whether because of the discovery of quantum mechanics, chaos, or the fact that we don't even know what most of the universe is made of, I do not know anyone who's that optimistic. But I still know a number of people who tend to think in the following terms, that if only we could learn all the physics, we would then be able to sort out chemistry, because chemistry is the type of mechanics. And if we knew all the chemistry, we would be able to understand all the biology, because uh, organelles are bags of, chemi of chemicals, and cells are bags of bags of chemicals. But this program, too, has not produced fruits. And uh, the reason is primarily because systems become increasingly more structured as we go up that scale. They become more complex. Now, even though complex systems is a common term now, I want to define what I mean by it because <clears throat> different people refer to 
this class of systems uh, in different terms. So to me, in this presentation, a complex system will be a system that is composed of interacting parts. And those parts exhibit collective dynamical behavior that cannot be anticipated from the behavior of the parts themselves alone. And by that, I mean that the interactions between the component parts are important, can be just as important or more important than the parts themselves. I used to give this example in the past, graphite and diamond, made up of the same parts, very different physical properties. Now, many people use that example, so I think it was great to graphene or something else. But the idea is that because of this fundamental property of these systems, that the interactions are determinant to the collective behavior and properties, uh, it's often the case that we want to study the network of interactions themselves. So they run themselves naturally to be studied as networks, to be modeled as networks of interacting entities. Now, the, this has many implications, but before I proceed, it's, of course, the case that the fact that uh, systems that are composed of uh, more parts require new techniques and lead to new consequences. This has been the basis of many fields, including condensed matter physics, and was popularized by Anderson in the 70s through that article. Now, when we compare with that article, in that article, Anderson used a molecule with only four atoms to illustrate his point. Now, the difference between that and what we are talking about today is in part the scale of the problems that we are looking at, the scale of the systems we are in, interested in. Systems like this one, a metabolic network where you have thousands of chemical reactions coupled together, or neuronal networks where you have, depending on the scale that you want to use for your units, 10 to 11 or more, coupled dynamical systems there, or networks of interacting species thousands or more in many systems. And even man-made systems, you would think that we understand them, and we do under certain conditions, but it's often the case that infrastructural networks are away from equilibrium. And under those conditions, we still have lots of questions about their collective behavior. Uh, so with those examples in mind, I want to make this first point that compared to research that was initiated in the past and it's still relevant now, and research that was initiated more recently in this field of uh, complex systems and networks, in the past they, the systems were often well ordered or well mixed, whereas now they tend to be well structured. And uh, I think this really picked the minds of a uh, number of uh, people in the areas of statistical physics and nonlinear dynamics. Uh, I recently noticed that in the, according to Google Scholar and some other uh, online systems, the single most cited paper in reviews of modern physics is now a network, is a network paper. That doesn't mean anything except that means that there are lots of people working in this field and definitely lots of papers being published in this area. And then you may wonder why, why physicists would be interested in that. And I think there are lots of reasons, including uh, social ones, but I think the reason, the primary reason is that a fast path to observe new interesting behavior is to explore interactions between things that have known behavior. Okay? And I think that's what fascinates people in this field myself included. I want to give you a few concrete examples of that, examples of my own research we have done in our group, just as illustrations of this idea. There was a time when I was interested in trying to create a metamaterial that could exhibit longitudinal negative compressibility. And uh, I realized that uh, my student Nicolau and I realized that you could easily do that if the constituents of the material were like this. Instead of just one part where you had uh, uh, an extra degree of freedom there, you can put together four particles to do that. These particles are interact with each other through attractive forces. 
uh, and they can be linear, except this one, which should be nonlinear to create a bias stability. So if you have a bistable situation for those two parts, because you can create a scenario in which when you try to uh, increase the force to tension the external particles, it will just stabilize the occupied state for these two internal particles. They will jump to the other stable state and will cause the other particles to contract. Now, when you put together a bunch of these guys to form a material that gives rise to a phase transition, and phase transitions of that form are really interesting because they can actually be observed without violating any fundamental thing in physics. Okay? This cannot happen, of course, continuously. But this is really something, a form of emergent behavior that you would observe only because we are putting together these things, simple things with known properties. Another example, microfluidics. The state of microfluidics now is, in a sense, like microelectronics before the integrated circuit, perhaps even before the transistor. Uh, the difficulties here is to create built-in control mechanisms. And uh, we have been trying to use network ideas to do that. So here's an example. Uh, if you load a channel with uh, obstacles that will introduce nonlinearities, which when the in interactions between the nonlinearities in that channel with this one here and the minor losses that come with it, uh, can give rise to situations in which you can switch flows from going up to going down here, even when you treat this as a two-terminal device. Now, when you use that to build a network, like a real microfluidic network, then you can create, you can program that network to create all sorts of output patterns by just changing one control parameter, the input pressure, even if you're treating the entire network as a two-terminal device. Okay, so we are taking full advantage of the network structure to do this type of thing. If you modify that slightly, you can even induce persistent oscillations in this system while holding the inlet and the outlet pressure constant. So then you can do clocking and other things that are relevant to control this type of system. Sorry that you cannot see well the image. Recognizing interactions is also important, of course, to understand the behavior of uh, existing systems, existing networks. And a key question in, the, in network science uh, concerns the spread of things, especially the spread of cascading failures. Until recently, it was not known why, and I think in many systems not yet known, why seemingly identical perturbations to a network would sometimes lead to no consequence, sometimes lead to a very large cascade of failures. And uh, in part because we are curious about that question, my former student, Yang, spent a lot of her time to build the largest possible network that was amenable to mathematical treatment and also could be validated with data, which is the North American power grid. This map looks different from the one you're used with because we then sequalized it. So we can then really study the number of conditions here and compare with the historical data to draw the following conclusion. The reason why that happens is because uh, even though you can have very large cascades that take down one third of the system, the number of elements actually failing in those cascades is very small. Even if you simulate hundreds of thousands of, of perturbations at the end, you get a small number of actual failures. All the other things that look like they are failing, they are downstream failures. Okay? And uh, that's an important conclusion here because this conclusion also transfers to any other network that has local conservation laws. Here the local conservation law is the Kirchhoff's law. In an intracellular biochemical network is the conservation of the number of atoms that are coming in and out of chemical reactions and so on. Talking of which, this also has illuminated this idea of studying the network of interaction new forms of gene interactions. And one of these forms uh, I have been very involved in studying, we refer to it as synthetic rescues. It's a situation in which the inactivation of a gene, a knockout of a gene, can 
be lethal to a single cell organism like a bacteria, but you can recover the lost function and make this, this strain viable again by concurrently knocking out other genes. It's very counterintuitive, but this is a network phenomenon. It's mediated by the metabolic fluxes in the network. So this is a new understanding that was not available before looking into this as a network. In fact, there are cases in which this type of interaction would happen through direct chemical interaction, but that doesn't seem to be the dominant effect. And this is important, for example, to the design of new antibiotics, because it is known that if we could design not one, but two antibiotics that interact antagonistically in the sense that the combination of the two is weaker than one of them alone, a cell that would develop resistance to, say, the suppressing of the pair, the suppressor drug, would effectively fill less of that drug and therefore would fill more of the other drug and end up being in a lower growth state. So with this advantage cells that have developed resistance. And this is something that my collaborators and I have been uh, working on. It took some 10 years to observe this experimentally, but we are very happy to have validated that mechanism recently, which gives us confidence that the same can be done elsewhere. And just as a final example, I want to mention that one thing that's interesting that we now can uh, do is to manipulate and reprogram the behavior of uh, large network systems. I'll give I'll use this example for two reasons. Uh, this is a form of cancer for which there is no cure yet, and for which the signaling network that's involved in this cancer it was built and validated with experiments by Rick Albert and her colleagues at uh, UPenn. Uh, so in this form of cancer, it's just, Cells from our immunological system that are supposed to, to get rid of pathogens and uh, dysfunctional cells, they start attacking normal cells of the system, that's the cancer. And um, it would be desirable to get rid of them without uh, side effects. And uh, so one thing you'd like to do is create a library of possible interventions that can get rid of them. And, uh, but even for a network like this, which looks smaller than some others I have shown you today, the combinatorial problem of considering all possible uh, uh, perturbations is, is untreatable. Until recently, it was untreatable. Now there are methods, and uh, a method that we introduced in this paper was uh, uh, pioneering that uh, line of research. Now, when you look at the result of uh, what perturbations are most successful, you see interesting things like this. Like, uh, sometimes you have uh, gene and gene products that are inactive in the in the cancer state, uh, and uh, sorry, that are active in the cancer state, and your intervention to get rid of cancer is to further activate them, which is counterintuitive. Looks like you are walking in the wrong direction, but this is a very common thing in network dynamics because of the interaction between network and the underlying nonlinear dynamics. So in this case, in particular, the method that we are using is. Uh, I will illustrate here with a two-dimensional potential. I will not show you the Bayesian boundaries, but this is a system with two attractors. And you're in the wrong Bayesian of attraction. You want to go to, the, to this target here, but you want to do that with the smallest effort. And so it happens that the best move is precisely to move in the opposite direction. Oops, I think I will have to press something here. Because, as you see, the future evolution of that trajectory is spiraling this way. So the closest approach point is actually on this side. In order to cause that point to get closer to the target, you have to move the initial point in the opposite direction. Okay? Not something that you would be able to anticipate based on intuition alone. Not something that you can predict using inspection of the network. The name matters. Okay. This is a double well potential system in one dimension. Okay. So that's the moment where you would have crossed the basin of attraction, and you see now the basin of attraction. This is two dimensional. We can actually calculate them 
we normally cannot do that above 10 dimensions or so. All right, so now what can I say then about new states in systems like that? Like many other complex systems, network systems can exhibit a variety of uh, solutions when you look at even simple dynamical equations, and, and those solutions correspond to actual states that can be observed in the lab in many cases. Uh, and of special interest are states that exhibit certain symmetries. Uh, now, a symmetric state exists if the dynamical equation, that is the system itself, has the same symmetry. So a rotationally symmetric solution will exist if the system has rotational symmetry. That's a mathematical fact. Uh, but more important than that is to <clears throat> observe that that sufficient condition for the existence of a state is neither sufficient nor necessary for this state to be stable and actually observed. That's not sufficient, I think we all would have agreed on because we, of the phenomenon of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? So you can't have a system with a symmetry and stable states not exhibit that symmetry, but the, it's not even necessary, okay? And this will be important for me later. Now, that symmetries are important in physics, I guess I don't even need to motivate much, but I want to quote a few guys. Uh, well, for example, said that as far as he could see, all a priori statements in physics have their origin in symmetry. Anderson suggests that it's just a small overstatement to say that physics is a study of symmetry. Galman linked symmetries with mathematical simplicity and therefore elegance of theories. And we'll check writing about physics in 100 years, anticipate that more discoveries will be made to the extent more symmetries will be discovered because symmetries are really the link between what is real and what is ideal. And if you ask someone to give you examples of systems exhibiting symmetry, you don't, you don't have to look further than just a lattice, and we'll see that even simple lattice like that have lots of symmetries. And here is where things start to be interesting. Until some 10, 11 years ago, many people in studying networks in the area of physics thought that networks was the big counterexample, the only area apparently in physics studied by physicists in which symmetries had no rule. And the reason is, when you look at networks, here's examples of very small ones, uh, many of the networks we study are disordered, and we don't seem to see any symmetries here, even though it's very immediate that there are symmetries in systems like that. Now, I all subscribe to that group and that line of thought until when it became clear that that was just an artifact of the way we were thinking. So the right way to think about symmetries in networks is more local than the way we would think about symmetries in the study of crystals, for example. Uh, let's say that networks are, for the purpose of this discussion here, dots which represent the nodes connected by lines that represent the interactions between those nodes. Let's ignore for a moment that those nodes are dynamical systems and that they are coupled to each other in a dynamic way. So a symmetry can be as local as the swap between two nodes if that leaves the structure the same, the graph the same, then you say that that's the symmetry of this system. So if you're representing this in terms of matrices and there is an adjacency matrix that represents the, the, the coupling pattern between the, the, the nodes, you say that uh, a permutation is a permutation matrix that commutes with the adjacency matrix. Well, even with that now rigorous definition, it's hard to see any symmetries here. But if you analyze more carefully these networks, even though they have the same number of nodes and edges, they have very different numbers of symmetries. The first one doesn't have any, the second has 32, and the last one has more than 5,000. And group theory then can be used to organize our thoughts here and to recognize that those symmetries define clusters of nodes that are structurally identical. And any network, absolutely any network, can be partitioned into a cluster, into uh, uh, clusters of, 
of uh, structurally identical nodes. Any network can be partitioned into symmetry clusters. Okay. Uh, now, since we cannot discover this just by inspection, we have to use uh, computational techniques to do that. And by the way, it's marked in colors here, the clusters in these cases. There are 11 here because they are all trivial, but here you can see the different colors marking the different clusters. But mathematicians have solved that problem, the computational problem. And uh, here is an important paper published in 2008 where the authors took networks from various domains in outside physics and some in physics. And here is the number of nodes in those networks. And here is the number of symmetries they found. Uh, these are not typos. So take the internet which has, this is a small piece of 20,000 nodes out of billions. And um, they found that uh, it has 10 to the 11,000 symmetries. So compare that with the number of atoms in the visible universe. And they are so confident about that algorithm that they wrote the prefactor for that. So yes, rigorous calculations right there. Uh, so with those methods that are now uh, readily available, we can study symmetries in any network. Um, and a process that I like a lot is the, proce is, is the process of synchronization, because it's a phenomenon that appears in many places uh, in nature, in technological systems, in social systems, in, 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 in biology, in our body. And uh, it is emergent and is, in fact, essential for the function of many systems. Okay? And think about uh, fireflies flashing together, uh, uh, mechanical metronomes uh, synchronizing when you put them on a, on a movable platform, uh, neurons fighting together, especially those in the circadian clock, uh, heartbeat cells, and so on. Okay? In many of these systems, this form of synchronization that I'm referring to here is emergent, is spontaneous, is not externally driven. So it is really due to interactions between these entities. So it emerges in a decentralized way. And that is, I think, uh, an interesting part of why it's so interesting. Now, symmetries have a lot of implications for synchronization. Uh, I just told you that you can break this, uh, you can partition networks in symmetry clusters. Those clusters are candidates for Synchronization, they form often in time synchronization clusters. Uh, but I'll give you an example of my own, which I think is more dramatic. Here's a system in which you have oscillators in, in group A connected to oscillators in group B, the lines represent the couplings, and oscillators in B connected with oscillators in C. You can have even simple systems like that with a you know, really defined, uh, simple network. Uh, it's not very important what's sitting here, but let's assume that the oscillators are chaotic, okay? Just to create an effect that I want. Chaotic oscillators, they remain chaotic when they are coupled. So you can have scenarios in which oscillators in A will synchronize identically to oscillators in C, even though they are not directly coupled, while oscillators in B that mediates the interaction between them is, are in an incoherent state. Incoherent with themselves, incoherent with those in A and C. Colors are marking the, what would be the generalized phases of these systems. So this is interesting for two reasons. But let me first tell you why this happens in the first place. It happens because the way I'm putting these oscillators and those oscillators is symmetric. I'm coupling these guys to B in a way that's symmetric the way I couple C to B. Okay? That gives rise to the possibility of this state existing, and under the right conditions, we can also cause it to be stable. Now, one of the reasons why this is interesting to me is the potential applications. You could think of this as a way to do physical key distribution, which is an important part of uh, cryptography. Uh, you can have Alice and Bob, each one of them with a random number generator that they use, to, and they also have an os oscillators and they are coupled to a network in a symmetric way, and those oscillators have a parameter that they will, they will choose using that random number generator. That's all they need in order to create a key, a random key 
that no passive observer would be able to get, even if it's measuring the state of all nodes in the middle. Okay? In time, I will describe the details. But if you have ever heard of uh, quantum key distribution, this involves some of the many elements, but relies on this form of synchronization instead of uh, entanglement. Now, one thing that of all the strange states that uh, uh, one can think of in networks, and there are many, uh, a class of states that has attracted a lot of my attention over the last three years is those states that require, they are symmetric, yet they require the system to be asymmetric. Actually, this was the title of a paper I published in 2013 with my colleague Takashi Nishikawa. And I want first to illustrate the idea, hiding part of the information so you are not distracted by the details. What I have here are, I like oscillators, okay? So these are oscillators too. And these are phase oscillators. They, have, they are on the plane. Each one of these oscillators has uh, the, this limit cycle that's marked here as a solution. And that solution persists when they are coupled. They are coupled in such a way that you have rotational symmetry in this system. Okay? So all of them are structurally identical. Therefore, they occupy identical states, identical places, identical positions in this network. Okay? Now, these oscillators have one parameter that I can set to be the same to all of them or set it to be different. If I set to be the same, I want to set to the value that uh, maximizes the stability of the synchronous state. And uh, even if I make that choice, that's the value that's marked inside each one of them, the system does not stabilized. Even if I start very close to that, that solution, that's numerically evolving it. Rounding is a big enough perturbation that kicks me away because that state is unstable. Now, after seeing this for some time, we can select a choice of parameters now that's non-identical and that will instead stabilize that state. So we see I change that value now to be non-identical. Oh, it's carefully select the value in a region where this would happen. And now you have stabilized that state. So identical oscillators do not stabilize to an identical state, even though they are identically coupled. But non-identical oscillators stabilize to an identical state. That's strange, right? So in part because of this type of research a few months ago when the Big Bang Theory came to an end. I was recruited to write an article for the conversation. Here is some of the dialogue that relates to a fictitious theory. I don't know whether you're familiar with this show, but the leading actor is, um, is really after trying to win the Nobel Prize. And uh, this was the most promising thing he developed throughout the show with his wife on his wedding day. Uh, so take a listen. Oh. Why do you keep tying and untying that bow tie? I can't seem to get it even. Well, I don't think it's supposed to be even. Sometimes a little asymmetry looks good. In the Renaissance, they called it sprezzatura. <laughs> Let me straighten your tie. No, 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 it's all right. It's supposed to be a little asymmetrical. Apparently, a small flaw somehow improves it. I can see that. Sometimes it's the imperfect stuff that makes things perfect. Excuse me. Something incredible just happened. Remember when you were telling me about my bow tie and how a little asymmetry is good? Yeah? My equations have been trying to describe an imperfect world. And the only way to do that is to introduce imperfection into the underlying theory. So instead of supersymmetry, it would be super asymmetry? <gasps> super asymmetry. That's it. You got the idea, right? So the best way to understand the example I gave you 
before the video is by comparing it with uh, the familiar phenomenon of symmetry breaking. In the case of symmetry breaking, you have a system with a certain symmetry, and no stable solution exhibits that symmetry. If you're studying quantum mechanics, you might say that about the ground state only, but stable solutions do not have that symmetry. Now, what I described could be regarded as a converse of that, the reason why we refer to it as converse symmetry breaking, which in addition to that, what you have is that in order to stabilize a symmetric solution, you have to break the same symmetry in the system. So what Sheldon was talking about in that video could be regarded as a form of explicit symmetry breaking. You explicitly break the symmetry of the equations, and usually that breaks the symmetry of the solution as well. But here you have this weird thing that you explicitly break the symmetry of the system in order to maintain that symmetry in the solutions, okay? So this is supposed to be surprising unless you have thought about it before. So let's study that example I gave you with just three oscillators so we can plot certain things. The oscillators are coupled this way through, the, through a coupling matrix that is written here, so there is really rotational symmetry as I promised. There are two variables, the angle and the radius, several parameters, but they are set to the same value for all of them, except this one, which I will allow myself to vary, okay? Now, this parameter, even if I change, does not change the solution of that limit cycle, but change the stability of it, because stability depends on derivatives, okay? And by the way, the number I was, uh, I'm, even if I consider beta going all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity, and I calculate the transverse Lyapunov exponent to that synchronous solution, which is what measures how stable it is, I will see that everywhere it's positive. Even the minimum of it is a positive number. That's why that solution will be unstable here. Yet there are non-identical assignments marked in blue here that stabilize it. So if you evolve initial states close to the synchronous solution, you'll see that the red solutions will diverge away, whereas the blue ones will converge to the same dynamics, okay? Now, I'm really requiring it to be identical synchronization. So it's the strongest form of this effect, okay? There are several ways to weaken it and see it even more frequently. But really, even in this case, you have this effect. So now, and here is the reason why I use it just three, so I can plot the parameter space. In the parameter space, you have this region in blue. It's a three-dimensional region, even though it looks very skinny. Within with, any choice of parameter will stabilize the synchronous solution. And the red line is the line along which the oscillators are all identical. And you see there is no inter, inter, uh, inter um, they do not overlap anywhere. Uh, now, you have then this situation, I will say once again, where you have identical oscillators in different states along that line, and you have different oscillators with identical states. Actually, that becomes, a, appears to be, we cannot prove that, but appears to be a global attractor, this synchronous state, if you choose parameters inside that region. So. Two more words about symmetry and synchronization then. If the interacting entities, oscillators or anything else, are identical and their coupling patterns are also identical, complete synchronization of the entire network is the state that inherits that symmetry, okay? That's why I'm talking about synchronization for the time being. We can generalize later. So the common assumption, I see this in the introduction of many papers in this area, is that Entities that are more likely to exhibit the, the same, that entities will be more likely to exhibit the same or similar behavior if they are equal to each other. Some people will go as far as to say that they must be equal in order to exhibit equal behavior, which is, of course, not true. So the example I gave you earlier, and I will uh, give you more, uh, shows that this is, in fact, false for systems of interacting entities. Interactions are essential here, okay? So, 
the converse symmetry breaking effect I'm talking about is a situation in the case of synchronization in which complete synchronization is not stable for identically coupled identical oscillators, becomes stable when and only when, the only when part here is essential, the oscillator parameters are tuned to non-identical values. Okay? So you break the symmetry of this system to, one, to preserve the symmetry of the state. Now, you could have broken that symmetry not by changing the entities, but by changing the way they are coupled. You could break the symmetry structurally by changing the graph itself, or both. And you could also ask the question of, say we don't have symmetry to start with. You don't want to study particular systems. You want to study a general disordered network. Well, then this effect becomes even more prevalent. Non-identical entities will definitely be more synchronizable in many cases. Okay? There will be, in many cases, a range of parameters over which they can stabilize the synchronous state, whereas identical ones cannot. Uh, the reason why I focus on the symmetric ones is to isolate the phenomenon. So many people have looked into symmetry and synchronization. Here are two of my favorite classic papers in this area. And more recently, people have also started to look into the impact of asymmetry, the beneficial impact of asymmetry. And here are some of the many papers, even though this field is, is still young. Now, I said that interactions are essential, and that is the case because this effect requires, at least to be non-trivial, interactions between elements in the system. And that's perhaps the reason why it's so counterintuitive, because it's hard for us to, or for many of us, to imagine the impact of those interactions. It's easy to imagine how things behave in isolation. So this is a slightly modified version of that uh, phase amplitude oscillator, that uh, model that I showed you in the previous slide, except I modified two things here. One thing was to cause the synchronous state to be a point. So it's a fixed point only now. So it's simpler to analyze. And there is a tunable coupling strength here so that I can vary that. Now, if you vary that coupling strength, as you can see that for this system, uh, we have always the non-uniform assignment of uh, parameters uh, over outperforming the uniform one. It's more stable, negative, more negative is more stable, so it's more stable than the other one, so it's the effect I was talking about. But the difference between them go to zero as the coupling strength is tuned to zero. So when you decouple the oscillators, that effect disappears. You cannot see it anymore. And that's also visible when you study the individual parameters themselves. Okay? These indexes are marking the parameters of the individuals, and you see the difference between them increases. Okay, as the coupling strength increases. It doesn't have to be monotonic, but you got my point that disappears when you turn off. Now, there is an intimate relation between symmetries and homogeneities, or, 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 or I would say symmetry is related to homogeneity and asymmetry to heterogeneity, okay, when you think in terms of parameters in these systems, okay? So either way, so you can see one way or the other, uh, in parameter space, usually when we observe this effect, is a mixed situation like this. It reminds me a little bit of chaos in Hamiltonian systems. You have um, a region of the parameter space, not the parameter that I'm manipulating to make it different. I'm talking about the global parameters now, like the coupling strength and coupling delay, or coupling strength and uh, um, something else that's common to all elements in the system. So when you have diagrams like that, you have a region usually in which both symmetric and asymmetric configurations are unstable. You also tend to have a region in which they are both stable, like if you increase a lot the coupling parameter or you decrease a lot the coupling parameter. And in the middle, ordinary systems would exhibit stability for symmetric and instability for asymmetric. But for the systems we are talking about here, at least part of that region is the other way around. Okay. So how general is this? Looks like that first example I gave you was things had to be chosen carefully. And I will tell you, uh, for other systems, for broad classes of systems, this is a very robust phenomenon. So my student, Yang Zhao, uh, worked on demonstrating that. and. Uh, he is summarizing his findings. I will tell you that what he notes is that for many systems, 
that are unstable when all the entities are identical, when you have perfect symmetry. Uh, when you increase the heterogeneity, there is a region, a uh, sweet spot or sweet region, over which you gain a stability. So heterogeneity is gaining you, gaining you stability, and if you further increase, you lose that stability, okay? So you can uh, see this with some simple examples. Here is uh, a set of simulations in which the only thing that's changing is the heterogeneity of one parameter in these oscillators, and this is measured by the standard deviation marked here. So for a small standard deviation, they behave very differently from each other. It's too large, too, but if they're in the middle, they phase lock. Let's see, starting out with them identical, that's what you'd have, okay? It would be absolutely phase locked. And then you have this situation, which here immediately desynchronized. Here you have transients, but these transients will die out, and they will converge to a phase locked situation. Whereas that one, that seems more stable, is in fact unstable. So intermediate levels of heterogeneity are actually beneficial. Uh, this tells you a lot about uh, mismatches, in, the impact of mismatches in experiments, particularly experiments for communication networks where synchronization is important. <clears throat> or, or the way in which biology might have handled itself. Uh, it's very common that people attribute heterogeneity in biological systems to imperfections of the world, so to say, accidental facts, not necessarily something evolved for. Uh, now, here is uh, something that um, I think brings it to uh, a new um, dimension. Uh, you can also, you notice that this last example, it was not identical synchronization, it was approximate synchronization, what I showed you. You might want to compare with identical synchronization. The same system allows you to change the parameters while maintaining identical synchronization, as long as you do that in a coordinated way, okay? You have three parameters here, you can change those two in a coordinated way. The identical synchronization remains a valid solution. And you can ask whether you can stabilize that versus perturbing them randomly independently and having just approximate synchronization. And it turns out that random outperforms the design of uh, identical synchronization. You have more stability in the second case, which is another layer of, uh, of things that, that, that you'd not be able to anticipate, I guess, by just uh, staring at these systems that can be measured in different ways. Uh, I just want to have two final points here. One is about applications and experience, and the other is that not everything is a network. So one obvious application of this is to power grid networks where the power generators have to be synchronized with each other. In the US, they are at 60 hertz, approximately. This is an example of a piece of the United States. This is an example of a piece from Europe. And uh, size represents the amount of power generated by those generators. And the color is a parameter that is actually the damping coefficient or a measure of damping in those generators. And uh, this is the optimal configuration in each case, which is much better than the homogeneous average one, and it's very heterogeneous in all systems, okay? So that's an interesting thing that could inform design in the future, in particular in connection with uh, renewable energy sources where you have the ability to introduce virtual inertia and manipulate damping. So this inspired us to also do an experiment. Until not too long ago, the most stable solution for systems like that was believed to be the one in which you would assign all the generators in the network with the exact same parameters, okay? But you can see that that solution is at an undifferentiable point, so it's very, it was very hard to evaluate its optimality. And it turns out there is another optimal point uh, that's globally optimal, really, elsewhere, where the parameters are non-identical, and you can see that even with just three generators. So we took that solution and we designed an experiment with three small power generators. We essentially inverted these things that are used in bicycles to generate light. And we coupled in a way that's truly symmetric. So we put the oscillators with a phase difference of 120 degrees, really, to make things symmetric and avoid all artifacts. And we measured the stability 
both when the parameters were set to be the same and when they were chosen to be in the predicted most stable configuration. The difference between those being positive would signal that we have this effect that I'm talking about. And that was the case in most experimental runs. So we take that as, uh, as experimental evidence that this is really real. Okay. Now, I was recently promoted to be vice president of the Network Science, Science Society. Now I feel that I would be remiss not to say that not everything is a network. There are many systems that are more naturally treated as, by con as a continuous system, for example. And uh, that's the case of uh, uh, fluid systems in general, even though networks have a place there too. So one question that we have been uh, interested in seeing to the extent to which this would manifest itself in other systems in which interactions matter. And I'm particularly interested, given that this converse symmetry break is, as the name suggests, uh, conv the converse of spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, whether we could explore this to stabilize uh, systems that would otherwise, be, states that would otherwise be unstable because of symmetry breaking. Just to motivate the example I'll give in the next slide, consider a bunch of uh, pendula connected with each other by linear springs. The image here is a bit exaggerated. Those springs are supposed to be all, always in the linear regime. And uh, let's assume that we are driving this system with vertical uh, sinusoidal uh, oscillations of given frequency and amplitude. If the frequency and amplitude are large enough, the, the solution that has the symmetry of the system, which is the pendulum will be all vertical, will become unstable. They will start to oscillate sidewise. Okay. This is what you observe. Okay. Now, if you break the symmetry of that system by, for example, doing this periodic break, or even random, you stabilize that, even under the exact same driving. Okay. So we tried to, we, 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 we did conserve certain things, not to, so the comparison is, is meaningful. Um, so this is a discrete version of uh, what I want to show in the next slide, that is uh, an example of this for Faraday waves. Uh, we just happen to have here uh, one of the main uh, leaders in the field, Faraday waves, so I assume that you might have seen Edgar in the past talking or publishing about Faraday waves. Here I would just use this as a, as a model system. And uh, the situation is, is the upside down version of the, what I just shown you in the previous slide. If you drive this with a frequency and amplitude that's large enough, the flat surface becomes unstable and you start to have standing waves there. Um, and uh, we want to, to ask whether by breaking the symmetry of this system we would um, stabilize that. And the way by which we want to break the symmetry, well, this experience is usually done with a flat substrate. Okay? So we want to use a non-flat substrate. Uh, some people have previously used a non-flat substrate, but small irregularities in the substrate to, to address other questions. Okay? Here are some of those studies. So here I want to use big uh, heterogeneity. So to say big non-uniformities in the bottom. Okay, so let me show you what the patterns we studied. These examples I will show you, we go from flat like this to something that's periodic like that or more random like looking like that. And um, if you choose this properly, you can create a gap in the dispersion relation. So there, are, there will be a, in the linear regime, uh, a forbidden region for uh, the resonance should take place, and you can use that to select regions. So here is the curves have the same colors as there. So you can see the region marked in light green is the region in which we have this effect. You are stabilizing the flat surface under driving that would be unstable, and sometimes the irregular one does better than the periodic one. Okay? But the periodic one is already a symmetry broken scenario. Okay? Here is uh, an experiment. My postdoc uh, implemented, where you are going to see a solution from this region here. So it's about a frequency of 
change something hertz, okay? And um, you you see that this is this is the flat bottom, and these two here are the regular ones, just like there. And you see that only one of them is unstable, just that one. The camera is almost synchronized with the frequency, so you can see what's happening. Okay. Now, this is representative of a much bigger class of systems, stabilizing or avoiding instability is a, is a, is a big theme of research that's recurrent in many areas of physics, including quantum mechanical systems that we have been studying more recently. And therefore, I think this is a good proof of principle. So as final observations, and I want just to comment on this form of converse symmetry breaking. What we have really discussed here, and I want to go back to the network case because it's easier to express things with a concrete example in mind, is that there are scenarios in which nodes need to be non-identical in order to stabilize your identical states, okay? even if they are identically coupled through the network. That's not obvious. Uh, from a symmetry perspective, this corresponds to breaking the symmetry of the system to preserve the symmetry of the stable solution of interest. And I'm talking about the same symmetry. Okay. Uh, so this is different from the Curie's principle. You might know that Curie's principle says that um, symmetries of the causes must be found in the effects. So symmetries of the system the theory, the model, must be found in the solutions, in the state, in the behavior you observe. That's what he says. Well, two reasons why that doesn't contradict what I was presenting. The first is that my statement is in the opposite direction. The second, so if this says anything is about uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking itself, and uh, the reason why it's not uh, in contradiction with the existence of spontaneous symmetry break is because this is about exact symmetries. It says nothing about stability. Okay. And Spontaneous symmetry break and the fact I was talking about here is all about stability. Now, one thing that comes out of this in the last few examples, I hope that became clear, is that it points to beneficial effects of heterogeneities and mismatches, okay? Things that might have been perceived as accidental in the past might not be accidental at all in natural systems. Uh, it also suggests a mechanism for a completely different form of pattern formation. Most of the literature pattern formation is about how something that has no structure through a spontaneous symmetry breaking or a symmetry breaking process develops a structure, okay? There was a time when embryogenesis was thought to be an example of this, and it goes from above cells to something that looks like us. Now here, you could think of the opposite happening, something that has a symmetry evolving to a more symmetric form, okay? Like a starfish, which is born like a lava and has then a five-fold symmetry at the end. Okay, that's a trivial example, but something that cannot be explained by other means. Okay. And finally, and perhaps this is the single most important thing, um, it, these examples I showed you, as benign as they, they sound and look, they, they show that it is possible that you have a phenomenon that is absolutely symmetric, the solution you are observing or the, the, observ the, the reality you are seeing is symmetric, and yet the theory that can describe that must be asymmetric. There is no symmetric theory that would explain that observation. Okay. And I think this is an important thing to investigate across fields. So I would like to thank again my collaborators, which were mentioned throughout the talk, and thank you for your patience. We may be able to use a few minutes for questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Adilson, for a very thought-provoking lecture. Um, it's time for a few, uh, few questions. Yes?
Yeah, question. Consistence of the solutions and to convince ourselves that they exist. But I don't think that we have all the full intuition yet of the physics that's underlying it. And that's part of the research to be done. Here. So that's just to excuse myself for not having a very clear answer to your question. But uh, what we see is going on there is the following. Uh, in a sense, when you break the symmetry, the number of stable solutions, the number of solutions with symmetry in the system will decrease. Okay? Because it destroys some of them. But for those that survive, uh, they can have an enhanced stability because the uh, breaking of the symmetry has an impact on the variation of the equation of the system. And now, if you have some we should have to look at the variation of the equation of the system. You will see that at the variation equation level, uh, the symmetry of the state that you are trying to preserve does not get to it does not commute to the variation of the equation. And not commuting there means it has an impact on it, that impact has to be a beneficial one. Would you go as far as uh, saying that um, this heterogeneity or imperfections is a is a design principle behind some of the uh, observed symmetric structures that you see in nature, or? Uh, so I have a student working full time on trying to validate that hypothesis. <laughs> and uh, I have reasons to believe that there are cases in which it's like that. But we have we, we, we have worked with that. I think uh, time is up. Uh, so let's thank uh, Professor Motter again for a very interesting